the two speakers for today is uh, Mr. Terence Corrigan, who is the project manager at the, the Institute, um, the, uh, where he specializes in work on property rights as well as land and mining policy. A, a native of KwaZulu Natal is a graduate of the University of KwaZulu Natal. He has held various positions at the IRR, South African Institute of International Affairs, uh, the SBP, and the Gauteng Legislature, as well as having taught English in Taiwan. He's a regular co uh, commentator in the South African media, and his interests include African governance, land and agrarian issues, political culture, political thought, corporate governance, enterprise and business policy. And then Mr. Martin van Staden is the head of policy at the Free Market Foundation, a think tank dedicated to promoting and defending individual liberty, private property, free enterprise and limited government. He's pursuing a doctorate in law at the University of Pretoria. Now, beyond all the formalities, the, the, the emphasis of these webinars from my side, perhaps, is um, something that the writer that uh, that you might be familiar with, Thomas Sowell says in one of his books. He makes a statement that universities in the main has taught as, or is busy teaching students what to think instead of how to think. And that is sort of the gist in terms of, of this, not only looking at content, but to see different perspectives, uh, different ways of thinking, different understandings and, and all these things. So that is part of the rationale for, for these webinars, to expose students, to expose um, colleagues to a, a wider conception of, of the common understanding of, of equality, common understandings of free, uh, freedom and all these things. So in terms of the format of the webinar, um, I'm going to allow uh, each speaker 20 minutes um, to present the, 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 uh, the, not papers, but the discussion. And then afterwards we can have a, a Q and A um, uh, on it. So uh, Terence, I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, well, thank you very much, Ivan, uh, uh, and uh, uh, to all those who've, um, uh, who've taken the trouble to join. And let me start out by saying that uh, I've been asked to speak on the topic of the perspectives on the meaning of freedom and equality. And since I work as an analyst and a commentator at the Institute of Race Relations, I do approach political matters with a stated um, ideological position, and that is I'm a liberal. And when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, that was a widely used insult, and it still is. And so as the French say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. So having acknowledged where I come from, uh, let me highlight uh, the words of the late uh, Roger Scruton. Liberalism is an intellectual tradition uh, formed from the interplay of the ideas of liberty and equality, and liberals differ among, uh, among themselves about which um, about whether equality or liberty is more important. Now this is important because um, since I work as a commentator and I'm not a philosopher, I try to keep um, my thinking related to uh, realities. And since I've been asked to talk about the meaning of these things, uh, let me settle on something that straddles both the conceptual and the practical, and that is uh, the concept of citizenship. John Milton once said, Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely accor um, according to conscience, above all liberties. Freedom was an idea to sort of force open the door, uh, to um, make the engagement with the political possible, but also in, in, in his time, the religious, with to open up society to ideas that hadn't been um, uh, uh, that hadn't been uh, countenanced before. Now, citizenship is one of those ideas that we hear a great deal about in, um, uh, in, in political thinking. It's ever present in political discussion. In broad terms, it describes the relationship between an individual and the state. Now, built into it are ideas of belonging and responsibility, how the individual fits into the political order, what calls he or she can make on the state, and also to um, on his or her um, uh, peers in society. Now, for the liberal outlook, the starting point is often reflexively to focus on the removal of restraints from the individual. Now, liberalism is, after all, a political perspective with a long pedigree of seeking individual autonomy. Um, it was also a, um, a philosophy that wanted to break down some of the arbitrary barriers 
uh, within society. Uh, you wanted to throw off the the the, uh, the restraints on action by the absolute monarch, by the church or whatever. But it was also about um, uh, about setting uh, about setting in motion the leveling of society, at least to an extent. So the merchants, the industrialists of the industrial revolution demanded something approaching equality with the hereditary states of the aristocrat. Later, the middle classes wanted uh, influence over their societies, which they felt their education and hard work were shaping. Later, the working classes um, and women, each wave of expansion of the boundaries of citizenship has made it a more extensive call on this idea of equality. This leads to what I describe here as the liberal dilemma. Participation, uh, what, what, what liberalism seeks is, um, is, is a some type of participation that is premised on the expectation that the role of each individual, politically speaking, is no greater than that of his or her peers. Each political participant is of equal worth and must be uh, granted equal esteem in the eyes of the state. But if we say that the individual is to be the appropriate object of the human experience, and thus of politics, as much liberty from coercion as possible must be permitted, and the individual is thus be free to pursue his or her aspirations. So there is a simultaneous expectation that there is an equality of political status and also an acceptance in some respects of profound inequalities within um, uh, uh, within society. And this brings us, let's say, into, um, uh, into the more nuts and bolts. Now, this is South Africa. What do we see here? Well, there's the glittering towers of Santa, as described as the most, um, uh, the most valuable, expensive, uh, wealthy real estate on the continent. Uh, you know, doesn't do too, too, uh, too badly by, by world standards. Then we have um, the image on the left, really not, uh, 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 not particularly nice, uh, uh, nice conditions at all. A politics that we often see as being dysfunctional, uh, unresponsive to, to, uh, uh, to people. And on the right, there's the what, what I think is becoming the ubiquitous, the ubiquitous symbol of politics in South Africa, which is the pothole. Um, and you know what, what, what I think potholes uh, signify to a lot of us is that it's something that can hit each of us, whether you are poor, whether you are wealthy, whether you are middle class. Um, it's, you know, the, the uh, let's say the, the infrastructure that should channel us all is increasingly equally broken for us all. What does this signify? Well, in some respects, it signifies this. There is a political there's a political matter here. And what I've done is I've taken the Gini Index for South Africa. And, you know, we can see starting off in 1994, it's, um, uh, it's high, but it's actually, you know, sort of been growing. In other words, South Africa has become, uh, over time, now this graph, unfortunately, goes up to 2014. But at um, 63 out of 100, with 100 representing sort of absolute um, uh, inequality and zero absolute um, uh, equality, South Africa has this uh, moniker, reputation, often described as the most um, unequal society on, um, on Earth. The question that, that uh, arises from that is this. Is full citizenship possible in a highly unequal society? Now, let me um, uh, let me start by by, uh, by saying a few things. Uh, South Africa is a very challenging case for the liberal Democrat and the liberal conception of citizenship. It, we are a free society. Um, this is not in the sense of the legal and constitutional order, but in the rambunctious co conduct of our politics. Uh, Milton would certainly approve of what we've, uh, you know, of, 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 of what happens here. I can say things. I'm sometimes asked by people who are a little disconnected from South Africa, but, you know, aren't you, aren't you afraid of you know, the government coming after you? My response is twofold that, first of all, no, I'm just not. I just don't think that that, uh, you know, the government is um, uh, is really up to it. Secondly, we have a political culture that is that, that is fairly open. Someone someone like myself would not be possible in um, uh, in in communist China. Someone like Martin wouldn't be popular, even in less re uh, repressive countries. I think, you know, Malaysia, for instance, certainly the Human Rights Commission has uh, set itself up as something of an arbiter for um, uh, trying to police people's speech. And um, the ruling party has bombastically declared its intention to establish hegemony. But this is laughable. Frederick von Zell actually put it beautifully. Even it is, if it is so that some intellects in government crave, crave for a Gramscian hegemony over the masses, they haven't got a snowball's hope in hell. 
The scope and diversity of civic action simply defies such a gimmick. Voluntary associations, the area of literacy, health, skills, development, business management, orphan care, combating AIDS perform magnificently. I have met and observed many of them. Of course, the government can play an important enabling role, but if it does not do so, it will simply be regarded as irrelevant. There is a boundless arrogance in the notion that you have the right to tell ordinary common sense folk what to think. I would go on to say that South Africa's um, uh, institutions have also been crafted on the assumption of equality. I think this was, as, as someone who had who who, um, who got to see the transition uh, in a sense up close, you know, in that I was um, uh, I was of age when it happened. I remember I, I remember this very distinctly. And uh, for those of you who remember the 1990s, you may remember this comment by uh, uh, by former Minister of Justice, the late Trevor Omar, that uh, what the government was after was um, to come to the firm conclusion that government must, within the framework of the constitution intervene to create real equality. I mean, that was stirring stuff in many quarters. We don't just want the, the legal equality, we want the real stuff, the good stuff. Um, and, you know, this was, um, uh, I, I remember in 1997, Nelson Mandela speaking at the notorious Mafeking conference, where the ANC also put the seal on cardio deployment, which I think has done uh, untold damage. He quoted, uh, Former U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson, we seek equality not just as a uh, as an input or as a theory, but as an outcome and as a result. And certainly, a great deal of politics has po uh, policy and politics has passed under the bridge, which has sought to um, uh, to, to to bring that to fruition. But you know, I would say that Omar's sentiments and those of Mandela do speak to a dire reality. Um, inequality has been a defining concept for South Africa. And um, lest it be forgotten, the foundation of the abuses that became so much a part of our history and our politics was founded on the denial of a common citizenship. The socioeconomic hangover um, was, largely, was largely rooted in that, although one can say a great deal about the various missteps that have happened in the, um, in, in the, intervening, um, uh, in the intervening period. Now, you know, when we talk about seeking equality in a, in, a, in a society like South Africa, I do think we must uh, uh, we we must uh, uh, be conceptually clear. We're not talking about a Soviet or a Maoist Chinese uh, uh, option. You know what what happens needs to ha needs to happen within the boundaries of um, of a relatively free political order. So, what are the arguments in, that a democratic state could make uh, could make towards the achievement of um, of equality. Now, so I, I, I'd, break, I'd break these into three, uh, three categories. First of all, there's the ideological one, a, a political belief in reducing inequalities, and authorities must intervene to use their power. You know, it's simply that that is the political principle. And I think that's to, to a large extent where, where, where uh, Minister Omar was coming from. Then there's a sort of normativity, and I would say this is rooted root more in culture. Um, the idea that uh, it is right and good to limit difference, that uh, there is something innately equal in a good society for all of us. Uh, so I think, you know, the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, has, has elements of this. And then there is also uh, a, a pragmatic argument. It's important to keep resentments in check. And if we keep people at a more or less comparable level, uh, you know, we can, we, we can see each other as, as, as equals. Now, from, a, uh, from the point of view of a, um, uh, of a political liberal, let me say that I... Um, I think we can safely discount the 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 ideological uh, impulse. That's just not the way liberalism works. Liberalism accepts uh, the idea of equality in certain in, in certain respects, but not a, but not as an absolute, and certainly not as a um, uh, and not as justification for coercion. Normativity, I think that's that that is something rooted in um, in, in in many of our cultural cultural frameworks. Um, but for me. As a um, uh, speaking politically, I would say that we could that we could sort of go into the um, uh, into the pragmatic argument that uh, there is evidence from a lot of the um, uh, literature on democratic transitions and consolidation and backsliding that high levels of inequality do uh, do function to undermine a society's democ uh, democratic pro uh, prospects. So ameliorating these conditions. Could, uh, could be argued to represent an attempt to preserve the greater object of democracy and, you know, from that, 
freedom within a society. So I would say that contrary to what is often said, liberals do have a stake in um, uh, in participating in a debate, even uh, uh, being sympathetic towards measures that are that, that are geared at reigning in inequalities. But this must be must be understood to be done with a um, uh, with a set of um, with a set of objectives in mind. Um, Liberalism would envisage a sort of meritocratic world where um, uh, uh, where people are free to, to 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 pursue their interests and have a real um, a real a real prospect of achieving them. So, yes, uh, what we start to talk about then is well, how do you do this? What what uh, 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 what is um, uh, what is what is possible with or what is acceptable within that framework? From that, we come to a, um, uh, a trifecta of questions. If we say that there is a that there can be a legitimate uh, a liberal argument in favor of um, striving towards a more equal society, and I'm not going to say eliminating inequality for reasons that I'll um, uh, I'll sum up in a moment. Let me uh, let, let me pose three broad questions. What what means may be employed to address inequalities? What compromises between freedom and equality are acceptable? And what is the intended outcome? And this is, and I think it's very important to um, uh, to ask these questions clearly and succinctly. Um, simply, you know, to 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 embark on a well, we must we, we must create an equal society. I think that that is the stuff of an authoritarian society. That is your Maoist um, uh, um, your Maoist argument. So the way I would address these is, by, is, is start by saying liberals need to stand firm on principle. That um, any policy or, or set of policies directed against equality must be rooted in appropriate political and constitutional principles. Chasing inequality, I love to use the analogy of um, of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. That can become um, uh, that can become a sort of fetish in itself. It ultimately becomes very very self destructive. Mm -hmm. um, Coercive and arbitrary power cannot be countenanced, and it also means that rights, that rights to liberty and property must be respected. There may be times, I'm sure, where uh, rights may be abridged. The argument uh, that 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 no right is ever absolute, I can um, I can accept that. But I, I do sense a disturbing um, uh, a disturbingly common argument, and I've heard this my my entire professional life that somehow. The right to, to 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 property is a dispensable one. That you know everything else is kind of sacrosanct to some level or another, but property is 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 one where um uh you know where we can um, we can cut corners. I don't think so. Now let me put this in in um uh, in in conceptual terms, or in in more practical terms. Something like land reform, for example, can be supported, but not on the basis of outright confiscation. Liberal thinking would hold a wielder of power. To a much higher standard than those subject to it. So, in other words, if you are looking at um, uh, at, at uh, taking property for redistribution, well, there are questions of compensation, there are questions of 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 um, uh, of due process, and appeals to to sentiment or historical wrong or whatever. I don't think of them themselves, you know, provide a, um, a, a provide an escape hatch from making those arguments properly. Now we also need to uh, need to be clear about what what the, the envisaged outcomes are. And let me say here that the the idea of equality of outcomes is to be viewed with suspicion, and I would say even horror. If liberalism accepts the validity of seeking self fulfilment and individual agency, then inequalities are going to be assumed. It is entirely legitimate that the outcomes are more favourable for those who are willing to put in greater effort and defer gratification for those who are not. Um, and this is why I would say that some variant of a market economy is also a non-negotiable. However, we all know that we start from differing baselines, and in a country like South Africa, that's a, that's especially true. Um, and much more will be factored into um, into our success and our prospects than just our blood, sweat, sweat and tears. Now, let me just say, for instance, the sheer fate of being born in one society rather than another, let's say in Canada rather than Mauritania, exercises a powerful influence on one's chances. If you are raised in an environment where talent is nurtured and achievement is encouraged, that, that you know that is in principle an advantage to have accessible educational facilities, and so on and so on and so on. And in South Africa, these were very very heavily influenced by 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 one's uh, one's racial background. I think increasingly, race is not the um, uh, is is no longer definitive, but it but there is a very very um, uh, strong link to um, uh, to socioeconomic class. 
And this is before we get into inherent and let me call them uh, sort of genetic um, uh, uh, determinants. For instance, someone like uh, Heidi Klum or Minky van der Veste isn't simply has advantage, simply has career options that I don't. Nobody is going to pay for me to uh, get up on a catwalk. The rules would defend measures that encourage the full uptake of one's abilities and expansion of the universe of choices available. In the 19th century, uh, there was a lot of liberal ambivalence about the idea of a universal franchise, but there was a lot of emphasis on uh, expanding the conditions by which people could participate. In the contemporary par parlance, this was what they called capacity. Uh, it, it's no surprise that educational reform was uh, uh, was uh, was very prominent, and over time, this is this is uh, this is expanded um, to where we have um, where there is you know a fair degree of liberal support for for welfareist measures. Um, I think that one can uh, uh, one can argue about the uh, about the affordability of, of of the welfare state, and then there are also big. Uh, 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 big questions. You know, liberals can have mixed feelings about this. For instance, what's, what quantum of entitlement to be made available and under what terms? So I can say education is necessary, though not always sufficient for mobility. So we generally accept that education must be uh, uh, must be provided by the state, by society, or you know, however you want to phrase it. Uh, so might support for those who cannot, cannot support themselves as a result of age or mental or physical infirmities. Healthcare, okay, perhaps, but where, but when the resources are limited, does this preclude expensive and experimental procedures? Um, should, in some jurisdictions, I believe in Sweden, um, this extent to prohibiting private procurement of medicines that are not available through the uh, through the state system? And recently, we've seen arguments made that data, uh, you know, your tablet or cell phone, recreational opportunities, and even sexual pleasure are human rights. So, who's responsible for providing them to whom, and at, what, at whose expense? Are these issues liberals should uh, should support, or are we, uh, you know, simply, uh, or, or are these simply um, uh, uh, ever expanding um, uh, realms of, of of entitlements that ultimately will uh, uh, will crowd out people's uh, 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 people's agency in the in 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 the name of fulfillment? And I think that one of the more thorny issues uh, that 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 confronts liberals, and particularly in South Africa, is the question of. Uh, Addressing inequalities rooted in systemic class discrimination, you know, and here we get into the question of uh, of race-based redress. Um, now, in principle, the, the argument would be that against the background of apartheid and its antecedent system, special preferences should be given to black people to enable or encourage or compel, depending on the discourse you want to invoke, uh, their participation in various aspects of the economy. Um, now. Once again, thinking back to the 1990s, I remember that these measures were often touted as being short term and, you know, we'll remediate with, you know, over a decade or so. And then it'll be um, it'll be left up to a to to, uh, to a sort of meritocratic process. Um, now, it's not uncommon to hear people say, well, they'll be with us for at least three or four generations, which I take to mean in practical terms that these that uh, uh, the argument is these uh, such um, uh, such policies. You simply have no expiry date. Um, now, we at the Institute have opposed this approach, or not for lack of recognition of the uh, discrimination and the damage. Um, uh, in fact, I would say that, that the work that we've done since the 1920s contains the most uh, extensive repository of damning evidence against um, against the damage of apartheid. And what I have argued is that the fact that, uh, that these inequalities were rooted in a particular set of policies and a particular policy approach does not necessarily mean that simply adopting the same approach in some sort of uh, a, a reverse order is necessarily going to be effect um, um, uh, going to be effective. Um, the key problem for me is that the metric by which this is uh, this is monitored is a sort of by the numbers demographic uh, approach. You know, you have a spreadsheet where you have so many, you know, you can you can measure the proportion of white males versus Indian females versus you know, you get the picture. Um, now I, I feel some discomfort at that, reducing people to um, uh, merely to the demographic markers. But more importantly, I think that this is not a solution rip, uh, uh, rooted in addressing the actual problems, but in the convenience of um, uh, of a bureaucrat or an administrator or an ideologist. Um, it takes no account of the numerous drivers of economic mobility and success, and whether you are actually um, you are actually tackling those. So. 
it's easier to, to draw up a spreadsheet. It's much more difficult to account for things like skills for a lousy education system or declining market salary scales, uh, low uptake of, um, uh, of entrepreneurship and all the rest. Well, let me say, you know, one uh, one big issue, I think, is, is linguistic background. Which I think gives someone like me who was raised in an English speaking home a massive advantage. Um, over um, uh, over someone who was that's, who was raised in a Zulu speaking home in 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 in, um, in rural KwaZulu Natal. And I don't have any easy answers to how you deal with this. I, you know, I also say when looking at some of the um, uh, some of the official reports on, um, uh, on 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 inequality in South Africa, how little attention is often given to understanding what lies behind the numbers. Um, the implication is invariably that some sort of racist resistance to transformation accounts for it. Um, and we've seen in the um, Employment Equity Act uh, the introduction of uh, the proposed introduction of fines that could conceivably shut firms down. I thought very much this is going to have a happy ending. So political humans often invoke political power to deal with societal issues, and this carries a great risk. Governments are not always adept agents of social change. And in a country like South Africa, we have a political class that has known very little of the world outside politics. As the adage goes, if all you have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. And uh, the potential um, uh, damage that this can inflict, I think, is, is, is self-evident. What our um, uh, approach has been is to argue for, for a, um, a policy approach that would target socio the socioeconomically marginalized. We also believe that you know you've got to look at um, uh, look at the reality of um, uh, of, the, of the of the society with which with which you are dealing, and I think here is a another thorny issue. South Africa often um, has or periodically has these um, uh, counterproductive uh, debates about the 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 role of the state. I remember very very uh, lots of fun in university classrooms in the mid 1990s. Um, you know, talking about, you know, well, we, you know, Sweden has like so much involvement in its economy and Singapore and this is all. Well, we this is no longer, to my mind, an ideological question since the state we have is not capable of doing that. Um, if we could get the Singaporeans or the Swedes to contribute their civil services, um, you know, I'd be very happy to have to, uh, to have the discussion on that phase. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I don't see any um, uh, any solution that really does not come out of extending um, extending a great deal more freedom to uh, those able to um, those able to, to 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 make it work. I'm thinking here specifically of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, we argue that we'll need a growth rate around seven percent sustained, and uh, to 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 make a serious dent on um, uh, on poverty in South Africa. And in so doing, hope you know the 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 goal would be to reduce the um, uh, the the worst effects of inequality by upliftment of those suffering the worst effects of poverty. Now, these poverty and inequality are uh, are separate issues, but um, I believe that that in um, in this context, the priority needs to be given to those uh, who are most socioeconomically deprived. The liberal impulse is to prioritize freedom. This is a normative goal and a pragmatic one. And dealing with um, inequalities, protecting a maximal level of freedom must be imperative. And as uh, the 18th century write, writer Thomas Paine once said, society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, it is an intolerable one. And when we suffer or expose the same miseries by government, which we might expect in a, in a country without government, our um, our calamities heightened by reflecting, we furnish the means by, with, by which we suffer. In other words, be very careful of encouraging more and more, um, uh, more and more government um, uh, government involvement, particularly given the reality of the state that we have. So, liberal democratic citizenship. Let me propose the following um, uh, the following schematics. I would say that we have that that. Uh, Reconciling the, the sometimes competing claims of, uh, of, of, of freedom and equality. First of all, a claim on equal esteem in the eyes of the state. In other words, every citizen means as, uh, means as much to the state as, as every other one. Questions of class, race, etc. should not play a, um, uh, a role here. A recognition that inequality is an inevitable outcome of freedom. The question, of course, is the extent. 
And that is why my fourth point is an acceptance of the distorting impact of material and social inequalities. These are real and they are and they they should appropriately be a concern for liberal Democrats, for society and for the government. Finally, whatever uh, uh, whatever path is chosen, it should be it, it should include a commitment to targeted action that enhances freedom and the ability of all to enjoy it. In other words, a focus on making on 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 allowing people to maximize their potential as opposed to trying to to trying to manage outcomes. Society like South Africa, this is not an easy thing. Um, but then I think that that uh, what is um, uh, I think that 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 democracy seldom is. Finally, I would just like to uh, like to have a little indulgence here. I often like to take my politics from entertainment, and uh, sometimes you can find some very very uh, uh, meaningful things. And there's a little book written in the 1970s by um, an American author Michael Shara called The Killer Angels. It was a novelization of the Battle of Gettysburg. There's a character, Buster Kilrain, who is presented as an Irish immigrant um, who's been a professional soldier, often acts as a foil to the more educated uh, officer. They're discussing why they are in this army, you know, poss uh, possibly to die. He, I think, sums up some words of truth. He says, the truth is, Colonel, there's no divine spark, bless you. There's many a man alive no more of value than a dead dog. Believe me when you've seen them hang each other. Equality, Christ in heaven, what I'm fighting for is the right to prove I'm a better man than many. Where have you seen this divine spark in operation, Colonel? Where have you noted this magnificent equality? Great white joker in the sky dooms us all to stupidity or poverty from birth. No two things are equal or have an equal chance, not a leaf nor a tree. There's many a man worse than me and some better, but I don't think race or country matters a damn. What matters is justice, tis why I'm here, and I'll be treated as I deserve. What my father deserved. So with that, um, I'm I'm going to hand over to to um, uh, to Martin. I look forward to um, uh, uh, to comments and critiques. Okay, uh, wonderful. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So Terence is always a difficult act to follow, um, and uh, something that must be noted is that uh, he and I both share uh, uh, the view of classical liberalism. So I know these webinars are there to encourage diversity of views, um, but I, I think everyone watching this video can rest assured that uh, our view is often very much a minority view. Uh, so to find the diversity, just Google uh, equality and inequality in South Africa, and you'll find uh, a lot of content that doesn't uh, rep reflect what we believe. Uh, so no, no worries there. Now, yes, as like Terence, I'm a classical liberal, and this ideology emphasizes ultimately the freedom of the individual. Now, both freedom and equality are ideas that have been the victims of what is called concept creep over centuries. And this refers to a phenomenon where notions like freedom and equality come to include ever more topics uh, within its rubric uh, as time goes by. And this is to say that people have over the years recognized the, the kind of normative importance that are attached to these ideas of e equality and freedom. And because these are so important, they kind of try to uh, incorporate other things that they regard as important into those concepts to kind of lend strength to that, even though those concepts, freedom and equality, they didn't, did not include that, that new substance uh, beforehand. Now, for me, it is important to return kind of to, to kind of very basic uh, uh, reasoning in this respect. Our most important method of communication as humans is through language and through words. And to me, this means that specific words and concepts must tend to have specific meanings. And that makes our communication richer, because if there is a new concept without a word, we invent a word for it, uh, and then we have a better conversation. It helps us understand each other better. And what I mean by this is we should try as far as possible not to reduce the kind of uh, terminology available to us by constantly lumping in ideas with one another so that at the end of the century we're only left with uh, a few hundred words in our political and ideological uh, uh, toolkit. Um, so just because we think something is important and another thing is important doesn't mean we have to merge these things into one. Uh, 
And in fact, I would say uh, we, we actively should strive not to do that. Now, allow me to turn to thoughts on the meaning of freedom and the meaning of it in, in particular um, from what I also consider to be a liberal perspective. Now, freedom is uh, uh, the far easier thing, I think, as far as the, the basics are concerned. Some people might disagree and say freedom is this very difficult kind of concept. I, I take a, a far more simplistic view. So freedom or liberty uh, from the, the Latin liber uh, means that a person may do as they please with themselves and their stuff. Now, this necessarily means that uh, one cannot stop others from doing as they please. Uh, so this concept, freedom, is both internally and externally consistent. It is a very neat package deal. Uh, uh, with, with, if you allow it to, uh, that is very simple and that doesn't have much uh, complexity. Uh, now, equality is significantly more difficult. Um, uh, uh, it is a fact that people are not equal in any meaningful sense that we can actually measure. Uh, we all have different skills, we all have different interests, we all have different histories individually and uh, 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 genetically. Uh, we all have different aptitudes and, of course, we all have different circumstances. Uh, and now society is a complex system uh, and, and that means that these differences between individuals will always produce different outcomes. Which means that as long as we are different, and here is praying to God that that is always the case, uh, primarily as individuals but also as groups, it means we will also always be unequal in most ways. And this must be the case. To try to guarantee equality of outcome means that there will be no freedom. Um, uh, uh, because it means that we must necessarily then restrict people's choices. If you and I must be equal, then we cannot be allowed to make different choices ultimately. Uh, because if we do make different choices, we will produce difference and inequality between us. So if I am allowed to go and buy sweets uh, and you are uh, you choose to eat healthily, then I will get sick and die and you will prosper. And that is uh, the inequality of outcomes that freedom must necessarily produce. But maybe a little bit more contentiously amongst liberals, I think the same is also true for so-called equality of opportunity. None of us will ever have the same opportunities. There is no equality of opportunity between me and a rocket scientist, for example. The rocket scientist, because of the choices that they've made throughout their life and the hand that they were dealt as far as intelligence, good parents, and good social circumstances are concerned, will always will have the opportunity to go to Mars with Elon Musk sooner rather than later, whereas I will have to wait centuries. I will be dust before I get that opportunity. But then there is also equality at law, or what uh, uh, Friedrich von Hayek called isonomia, a Greek term, which is closer to what I think is the most solid conception of equality. But if we are really honest, uh, uh, we also realize that true equality at law also cannot, does not, and never has existed. Parents have special rights over their children, and children in particular are recognized as having limited legal capacity, as do some uh, disabled adults. The law also necessarily treats police, police officers differently, and it treats corporations differently from natural persons. So in some sense, therefore, it is, it is a fool's errand to insist on kind of absolute legal equality. Uh, but I don't want to get too deep. I must say that I do think legal equality is the correct standard. But we need to understand it with uh, a, a term I, I hate. Uh, we have to understand it with nuance. Um, and that is why I think the, uh, the word equality is perhaps simply misleading and likely less useful than it might at first appear. Equality is a simplifying word uh, for what I think is an incredibly uh, difficult and complicated uh, kind of uh, uh, a package of concepts. But I will elaborate a little bit more on legal equality since uh, I, I am trained in law, so that is kind of my, my interest. So from a classical liberal perspective, one should not attempt uh, to make anyone equal in any way. Instead, we look to legal and political institutions and say to them that they may not give preferential treatment to any subjects under their jurisdiction 
and that those the functionaries of those institutions must be bound by the same rules that subjects are, and this is often called the rule of law. And this provides everyone, rich and poor, powerful and vulnerable, the room, the freedom, to make a success or a failure of their lives without being coerced one way or the other. Uh, nowadays, it's very much assumed that you must succeed and if you failed, then somehow society has failed and society must help you. you we see this manifested in bailouts. Uh, in, in many cases, we see this manifested in, in welfare. Uh, this is something that Terence and I, I believe, disagree on. Um, welfare in South Africa is not only for people who cannot uh, uh, look after themselves, but it's also for people who prospered, made bad choices, became poor and now they are entitled to welfare. Uh, so we as society, um, I mean, this it is what it is, but we have made a, a choice to, to uh, embrace the success of others, but not to accept failure, which I think does hold a long-term threat to, to freedom and the spontane spontaneity of society that I think we should prize. So in his defense of the concept of isonomia, legal equality, Hayek quotes the Law of the Twelve Tables, which was uh, one of the cornerstones of ancient Roman law. Uh, and ancient Roman law remains today the foundation of South African common law. The Twelve Tables uh, provided that, quote, no privileges or statutes shall be enacted in favor of private persons to the injury of others, contrary to the law common to all citizens and which individuals no matter of what rank, have a right to make use of." Close quote. So one must note here that the common law, the law common to all citizens, the jus commune, is taken as a given. Here, there, and here, in fact, there might be some unequal treatment of people. For example, the rule that says children do not have the same legal capacity that adults do. But it says that outside of this law that is common to all, which is a spontaneous law that is observed rather than made by political legislatures, there may be no preferential treatment. So the Romans, according to Hayek's interpretation of Marcus Tullius Cicero, held common law above legislation. Uh, this means that spontaneous law, which is in effect the kind of the law of the people, overruled the law of the politicians. Back then, it was understood that portions of common law might treat people differently. But because it was common law, which is refined over time, and crucially, this is the crucial bit about common law, it only applies in specific circumstances between parties that have declared a dispute before an impartial arbiter. This unequal treatment, unequal as it may be, was not arbitrary. Now, the law of politicians might be, and in my view, is usually arbitrary, which is why Isonomia said that the law of politicians, legislation, acts of parliament, regulations, must observe the principle of equality at law. Now, as everyone here will know, today we have flipped this script entirely. Somewhere in the intervening two millenniums, we decided that legislation must in fact override common law. And while we have tried our best to entrench equality at law in constitutions and in legislation, we have never quite achieved it. Today in South Africa, for instance, we have uh, hundreds, uh, uh, we have over hundreds of years of history, had a whole body of racial laws. Uh, and, and I maintain uh, uh, an index of these laws on behalf of the Institute of Race Relations, which anyone can find at racelaw.co.za. Uh, we've had hundreds of these race laws over our history, and many hundreds of them remain in force today as we sit here. And we have also only recently, very recently, in fact, gotten rid of laws that discriminated uh, on the basis of sex. Now, perhaps a more uncon uncontentious piece of legislation uh, is something like the Legal Practice Act uh, and the Attorneys Act and the Admission of Advocates Act before it, which said that only certain people may practice law and appear in court, attorneys and advocates. And think of other uh, forms of occupational licensing as well, accountants, uh, uh, for engineers, uh, and so forth. 
this is legislation, the law of politicians, not the common law, not the law of the people, creating an equal application of law. And of course, there are reasons for this. There are always reasons for everything. I'm not saying that there aren't reasons, but we cannot deny that this is inequality at law. The point here ultimately is that like equality in general, equality at law is a complicated idea. But I do still want to emphasize that it is less complex than equal outcomes and equal opportunity. As a classical liberal, I would say that we must contend ourselves with equality at law or isonomia and let go entirely of thoughts of equality of outcomes or equality of opportunity or what in South African law today is called substantive equality or as Terence uh, quoted, uh, Dola Omar's real equality. We, we must do this because, in my view, the protection of freedom, the other concept relevant today, is more important ultimately than the insistence on equality. Freedom is that element of every decision, of every action, and of every omission that renders it either virtuous or villainous. Freedom is what distinguishes sex from rape. Freedom is what distinguishes a donation from robbery. And if you are religiously inclined, freedom is what makes our decision to love and glorify God sincere. If we are simply forced to be Christians, we are not truly Christians, but prisoners of someone else's preference. There is no virtue in, in worshiping God uh, because you are forced to or because you expect that the state will throw you in prison if you don't attend church on Sunday. There is no virtue in that. There is only virtue in choosing to do that. So we as individuals might value other things very highly, other things apart from freedom, and among them might be some form of equality. But we must never allow ourselves to sacrifice freedom in the process, because freedom is one of, and in my view, perhaps the only coherent, legitimizing element to all endeavors. Now, as I conclude, I wish to make some passing remarks about inequality in particular. And I think it is fair to say that there has been a preoccupation with inequality over the last few decades, not only in South Africa, where, as Terence noted, I think uh, it might make more sense for us to be preoccupied with inequality here, but really around the world, uh, even in, in relatively wealthy societies like the United States. But in my view, this preoccupation is by no means part of human nature. The, the the preoccupation and struggle for freedom, on the other hand, is undoubtedly part of our nature, and I might even say part of our biological nature. Even though, even even without a a child, a baby, uh, or uh, being taught anything about freedom and John Locke and Thomas Paine, uh, uh, that person, or even any animal with no capacity to understand the theory of freedom will always try to free themselves from restraint. No animal, no child simply accept, accepts being restrained. Uh, and people might say that this is more to do with survival than with this nebulous concept of freedom. But to me, it simply confirms that freedom and survival are entwined concepts. But even then, though, even if our survival is not threatened, we naturally insist on freedom. We see this with youth when they enter that phase of rebelliousness that, that all of us went through. Um, they do not want to be told what to do, even though their chances of survival are in fact higher if they listen very closely to what their parents command. And it is different with inequality. Nobody really today wants to be equal with anyone else. Virtually everyone, and of course there may be exceptions, wants to be better and to do better than everyone else. And I'm, I'm not saying this in a, in a kind of a mean-spirited way. We want to kind of just get ahead. Um, but people are competitive and cooperative by, by our nature. We constantly want to improve ourselves. We want to improve our families. We want to improve our communities. Um, and that often means, I think, no, that always means that we, our families, our communities, simply progress beyond what others have achieved, what other individuals have achieved, what other families have achieved, what other communities have achieved. Um, so, so my point is parity, equality, this real equality, parity with others is not a motivating force 
in human nature. It is, it is, I submit, a political and ideological invention. And it comes exclusively from political agitation. And at that, it is a relatively recent phenomenon, I would say. As Terence mentioned, uh, resentment sometimes co comes about in, in circumstances of huge inequality, and that could lead to civil strife. Um, but I would wish to add that this is not this is not spontaneous. Uh, it, it is, to my knowledge, almost always a planned and a crafted strife. Uh, uh, that, that comes about. Every Marxist revolution, every socialist revolution in history did not, as Marx predicted, come about because the proletariat was so unhappy with inequality and they rose up against the capitalist exploiter. That never happened anywhere. What, what always happened is that people who read Marx and were convinced by his argument went out into communities and did what is called in Southern African uh, revolutionary kind of theory, they activated the population. They went into the population and said, look at this inequality. Aren't you outraged? Look at it. You have to be outraged. Uh, and, and those people became outraged. But this was invented. They, they would not spontaneously be outraged. Um, of course, I must emphasize, people were outraged by restrictions on their freedom. Uh, and, and, and even more than that, uh, 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 by by simply unfair treatment, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so while the, the notion of uh, the struggle for equality sounds noble, it often descends into a coercive enterprise that vests government with significantly more control over the spontaneous order of society than it has any right to have in reality, um, uh, over, over the spontaneous formation of, of circumstances and of, of, of markets and of uh, context and so forth. So uh, the, the preoccupation with inequality that I am criticizing is not the same as the desire for fairness. Fairness and equality, in my view, have very little to do with one another. So some situations, of course, demand equal treatment for fairness to be present, but this is by no means a hard rule because other situations will often demand unequal treatment for fairness. To be present. Unequal treatment is a perfectly normal and I would say a perfectly acceptable and fine phenomenon in daily non-governmental human life. We treat our naughty children differently from our well-behaved children. We treat our spouses differently from how we treat others. We treat our parents with reverence that we do not afford others. And to my dismay, we also treat politicians with reverence that we do not afford others, which we need to stop uh, post haste. Um, and even though the law unjustifiably, in my view, makes it Ill illegal, employers also treat employees differently based on various factors, uh, including how well they get along and how well the employees act according to the uh, employer's expectations. So I, I want to go as far as to say that everything, everything that we decide and everything that we do and everything that we omit doing has unequal results upon others as a necessary consequence. And I think this is okay. And this must, of course, be distinguished from the uh, from unequal treatment by governments, which, as I've explained, is a different beast uh, and not so easily justifiable. The fact, for take just one example, that all of us are expected to pay taxes means that the government, very much unlike private companies and private citizens, does not easily get to discriminate between us. Because when it does do this, then that government begins to lose its legitimacy and the laws that that government makes uh, begins to lose their conscientious bindingness. And we saw this during the, the apartheid years, where the government absolutely treated people unequally, where it had no right or no authority to do so. Um, and the people who received the, the, uh, uh, the short end of that stick, uh, black South Africans, did not have the same level of reverence for, for acts of our sovereign parliament as the white population did, and rightly so, because while black South Africans were expected to pay taxes if they earned money in South Africa, they were being discriminated against legally. So the law, it can be argued, was not binding on them in conscience. And this is a problem for the state. The state should always and does always 
always want people in its society to regard uh, uh, laws as binding in conscience. They don't want people to just be afraid of going to jail for violating the law. They want people to think, wow, I am a law-abiding citizen and it's very important for me to do what the law says. The state wants that, uh, but the state will lose that if it discriminates uh, between people um, uh, on, on quite arbitrary bases. Now, members of the audience might have flashes of uh, squatter, squatter camps side by side with affluent mansions like Theron showed earlier uh, in their minds as they listen to me speak about the nonsense of inequality. But I must provide a, a little bit of resistance there. Uh, I have not mentioned poverty once, only inequality. Poverty is a real thing with real solutions. We've other countries have defeated poverty. The recipe is there. It's it's right there. It's waiting for us. Um, but the problem with poverty is that people are destitute and cannot provide for their basic needs and desires. The problem with poverty is not that other people are wealthy. So, uh, and, and Terence also alluded alluded to this difference. Now, in my view, we should celebrate justly acquired wealth unconditionally. When a CEO of a successful company that has provided uh, uh, a huge value add to the community by providing a product that the community wants, if they get 50 million rand at the end of the year as a bonus, that is wonderful. That is that is something that must be celebrated because if, if, if that company had not provided a good service to the community, to society, that would never have happened. That, that person would likely have been fired. Um, but instead, we see through the market mechanism uh, where people have provided a huge value add to our economy, to our society, and that we must celebrate. We must be happy when companies have, have uh, windfall profits. We must be happy when when uh, people uh, uh, go from being middle class to being millionaires, from millionaires to being billionaires. Uh, and in all those circumstances, we must always just ask, is this wealth justly acquired? And that will always be a factual kind of determination. It's not it's not a, a hashtag vibes determination. Oh my goodness, I really don't like that guy or that guy has that skin color. Therefore, ergo, uh, it's just the acquired wealth. You must actually do the work of determining whether in fact the wealth is justly acquired or not. And the last two or three centuries in human history since the, the industrial revolution um, and, and really, in fact, the last few decades since the Second World War ended, uh, have been the most prosperous years in all of human existence. Labor specialization alone has, in most part of the world, eliminated the need for each of us to be a gatherer, a producer, a manufacturer. Um, uh, with, with some notable exceptions, we do not have to go and hunt for our food anymore. We do not have to process the food in, in many respects any, anymore. We simply have to buy it because other people who are better at it than we are uh, have already hunted and processed the food for us. And even in some of the, the very poorest regions of the world, infant mortality today is the lowest it has ever been. Modern medicine and the market economy, I must emphasize the market economy, have amongst other things like technological development as well, ensured that the elimination of absolute poverty, poverty is within reach. So it is not because there is inequality that people live in tin shacks in South Africa. It is because there is poverty and that poverty can be solved. Inequality cannot be solved. And if we try to solve it, I think there is a guarantee that we will worsen poverty in the process. The solutions to inequality and the solutions to poverty are not the same thing. Uh, these are, are diametrically opposed interventions. So if all wealthy people disappear tomorrow, the poverty would still be there, even though there is no more inequality. So speaking about poverty and inequality as if they are in any way related is misleading at best and very, very dangerous at worst. The reality is that the preoccupation of inequality is often no more than what I call an academization, an academization of poverty. It takes poverty from a real and quantifiable problem and makes it into an academic, a theoretical, and an almost philosophical problem. And I think we will do well to resist this distraction from actually getting our hands dirty and solving poverty as much of the world has done very successfully. 
And uh, I know a minister recently said that, oh, you cannot expect us in, for, in, in just 30 years to kind of uh, redress the, the poverty that apartheid caused. Of course, we can expect that because other societies have done it in less time. Um, and and we simply are distracted in South Africa. We are very, very, very distracted. Uh, and once we get rid of the distractions, poverty is not a it's not a difficult issue to solve. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any comments and questions. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Terence. Um, yeah, th thank you so much for presenting. I think as you both appreciate and noted would in many quarters be seen as, as very controversial. Um, but as I said from the get-go, my heart in terms of these webinar series is, is to open up dialogue in, in terms of presenting different philosophical and theoretical views on, on these concepts. But I think, um, and I'll open up the floor for questions in a moment, uh, I think what you, Martin, also touched on for, and and it's something that is so vitally important to to science is the no notion of conceptual clarification. To there must be some agreement on concepts, what they mean, and all these things. And I think you 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 absolutely correct in that. I've got many questions, but um, let me first. Um, open up the floor you're welcome to unmute yourself and but before i do that just once again i need to emphasize um this is one of a series of webinars we're presenting one view today there will be different views different conceptualizations and all these things so um just keep that in, in the back of the mind you're welcome um evo you're welcome to unmute yourself and and pose a question thank you Evan, and uh Great talks by both of you, uh, Terence and Martin. Really appreciated. Um, I've got two questions for Terence. Um, you mentioned studies that found a correlation between high inequality and democratic backsliding. Um, did they find a causal relationship? Or is there a secondary cause, such as that in some countries with high inequality, the wealthy might have an outsized and unequal and ultimately illiberal influence on government, thanks to corruption or crony capitalism? And conversely, would that correlation then disappear in the absence of an improper corporatist relationship between big business and the state? And then my second question, in a society where decent basic services and a social welfare system ensures a minimal but sufficient standard of living for the poor, right? So let's just assume the poor are okay, they, they can survive. Does it matter whether the rich are 50 times as rich or 500 times as rich? And if so, given that intervention to reduce this gap will likely suppress economic growth, why? Wow. Uh, OK, um, on the um, on the first one, it's a it's a theme that comes up as I said, look, um, I was quite deliberate in saying there is some evidence. Um, I'm not entirely um, I'm not entirely sold on this, but uh, there's a school of kind of political science that's mostly American, which uh, works on which works on correlations. Uh, you know, you take a, your panel of 50 countries over 50 years, and when when was there a transition, and what were the factors? A lot of this then depends on the methodology and how you and and how it's how it's constructed, what factors you're looking at. This does see the the um, a large. A large element of um, of inequality is correlated, and I think that's that, that's about as far as we can go with um, uh, uh, with with democratic failure, or or conversely, um, a declining inequality is uh, uh, is 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 correlated with with democratic uh, um, consolidation. Um, of course, there there's also um, there have also been arguments that it sort of, that sort of works uh, that that this is not a major issue. And remember, all of these studies will will, will invariably take into account, you know, like uh, uh, you know, x number of other factors. So, what is the so uh, the per capita income of a country uh, is a is a fairly solid predictor of um, uh, of its democratic prospects. That's why. South Korea and Taiwan made um, and Spain made quite uh, uh, made quite good good um, uh, good transitions. Whereas uh, countries in in the Sahel region, for instance, um, have found it a lot more challenging. Now, South Africa in that respect is a bit of a is a bit of a 
an outlier because uh, you have a very you have a segmented population and if you sort of took like white and indian people and put them into into a sort of separate country you have you have a kind of uh uh low tier european uh, european uh, gdp purchasing power per capita population if you take uh, if you take african people it's it, 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 it looks very very uh, different so um no look i don't uh, i don't think and you know you 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 would also then have to uh, have to factor in you know like spain's transition had a, a lot of that had to do with um with it wanting entry into what was then the European economic community. Um, so you, know, you just happen to be in a um, uh, in an area of the world where your neighbors are, are democracies, and where they put pressure on you. Uh, South Korea and Taiwan also had to deal with, um, you know, being supported by the United States. It was a bit of a, a bit of a domestic issue, you know, uh, just how how palatable is this to your to your uh, uh, to your domestic population. Um, a place like Niger has an issue with an Islamist insurgency. You now that probably trumps, you know, a lot of other factors. So yeah, look, it's it's it, it's complicated. As far as the poor being okay and but but um, uh, um, uh, uh, inequality being high, the only response I can give is, you know, does, is someone going to make that a political issue? Um, uh, look, if 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 we could. Keep South Africa's Gini coefficient as it is, but you know, bump people on the bottom uh, in the bottom up to an income of twenty thousand rand a month. I would say you know, we should be dancing in the streets, and this should, and this miracle should be taught at every development school in the world. But there, you know, there are still people for ideological or normative reasons who will say that that this is the most dreadful thing ever. Um, you know, it, uh, it's it's often been said that that um, uh, the United States is an interesting case. But although it has had periods, you know, of, of serious deprivation, periods, you know, and it's always had a um, uh, had a great deal of inequality, not just in terms of um, uh, in terms of income, but you know, regional disparities, uh, you know, institutionalized racial discrimination for you know, in parts for you know, for long periods, it's never been able to produce a a, a strong socialist movement. Now, uh, why is that? Now, a, a lot of this, you know, um, uh, I think has to do with uh, with another factor that's that's also been studied by political scientists, the kind of future orientation. Do uh, you know? Do 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 you believe there's a real possibility things could get better for your, you know, uh, if not for you than for your kids? Um, in fact, it's often it's 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 been said that a problem that that advanced democracies are facing now is that they're not is that that sense is 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 fading. Um, that uh, you know you reckon that you're going to have it better than your kids, and that's a deal you don't like. So um, yeah, you know, is 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 this something that could be part of a political political play? Um, it it may be, it 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 may not be, and I think you you know, it's also like you know, what what matrix of factors does it does it exist within? Uh, Martin, if you perhaps have a response, I, I, I gather that you might, especially given it is one of those widespread arguments about, you know, the, the rich are growing richer, the poor are growing poor. I think that, that's, a, um, whether it's in the US or here, that's one of the uh, arguments that are often made. I'm curious to, to hear from, from your perspective, especially in terms of, of, of the emphasis on the market and, and all these things, uh, how, how you would respond to to that uh, part of the question as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean that. Yeah, it's it's. I would say that's a relatively recent kind of phenomenon, and I don't think you can you can necessarily deny that outright. But for, I would say since the industrial revolution, the trend has been kind of. Uh, very clearly in the direction of everyone is simply getting richer. Uh, we the humanity has achieved that point where the the end of poverty is 
is not just conceivable, but it's it's perfectly achievable and, and it has been achieved in, in many respects. Before the Industrial Revolution, the concept of ordinary people who are not born into like royalty or into strong merchant families achieving a comfortable level of living was simply it it wasn't it was it wasn't even thought of. It was a totally inconceivable reality and that is not the case anymore and that's something that because we're so now now focused contemporarily focused on what's happening right now we kind of miss the huge human progress that has been made on the back largely of the market economy and specifically on recognizing that ordinary people are allowed to own actual landed fixed property uh, since we kind of made that decision as granted western society but uh, other societies have have bought into it in, in many respects very successfully. Uh, when we made that decision, uh, uh, we've we've gone ahead and, and really uh, jet, jetted out of poverty. Now, yes, uh, poverty may be getting worse today, and I think uh, that that became very stark, in my view, with the COVID-19 lockdowns. That, to me, manifested how in, 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 it, it, it was a, a very focused case study of what happens when policy is involved in economy. And the result of that in South Africa alone was about a million more unemployed individuals and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of businesses closed their door. They didn't have to close their door because of a virus. They didn't close their door because of uh, difficult economic circumstances. There was no fuel shortage. There was no shortage of money. The only reason they had to close their door was because to close their doors. And that is a stark example of, of how uh, uh, politics makes uh, 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 government interference, makes poverty worse. But we experience that on a far less intense level every single day before lockdown and after lockdown in the form of various policies that don't say your doors must be closed, but that impose these extra compliance burdens on you as a business or on you as a job seeking individual that just to make it difficult for you to use your freedom and the aptitudes and the skills and the abilities that you were granted uh, to liberate yourself from, from your lot. Um, so yes, poverty may be getting a little bit worse for, for the poor now. And I would attribute to that, if not, if not entirely, which I would, I feel very tempted to do, entirely due to political interference in the market uh, in the market system i would say very very largely there is some element of political do goodness uh, in the background making people poor uh, uh, rather than just saying listen we trust you we trust you as a, a poor person that when given the leeway you will pull yourself out of poverty which i think we always see that when people are left free they will do what it takes not poor and to not suffer. Um, and when we try to uh, use politics and uh, artificial mechanisms to get them out of that, it, it usually ends up producing more harm than good. Um, I'm not sure if there is any there are any other questions from the panel or uh, um, Terence or from the audience. Yes. Well, look, just uh, you know, if, uh, uh, waiting, waiting for anything else. Let me uh, let me just say that there, that there is an interesting, um, uh, another interesting factor, and it's what I would call the role of um, uh, the the role of your sort of background culture. Now, um, I um, I always find find it interesting to read about uh, to read about the Nordic countries because depending on you know they've they've, they've sort of become totems. Of everything that's wrong with the world or everything that's that's right, you know, it's either heaven or hell. In point of fact, the um, uh, first of all, Sweden, which which seems to be the, the one that attracts the most uh, the uh, the most lightning, positive and negative, is not a socialist country. In in the 1970s, it, it had a fairly statist economy, but but that's mostly been liberalised. Sweden, in many ways, is is a far more free market um, uh, uh, free market economy um, uh, than. Than many of its peers, it does have a, a, an extensive set of um, of, of uh, um, social services, um, most you know mostly built off the back that it actually, that it actually has a very you know a, a robust innovative economy. But what you know what it does have is it's an extremely high trust society. 
So, um, you know, and this is this is why going, going back to the 1990s on questions like privatization, I remember reading an article about, you know, why we should, you know, why we why we need to nationalize everything. Because if you look at water in Manchester and water in Gothenburg, where the one's privatized and the other is state owned, well, you know, the Swedes are just like, you know, they've proved state ownership. And I said, well, you know, could, could, could we get the Gothenburg City Council to take over South Africa? Because you know this is um, uh, 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 this is the point. Sweden is also an, ext uh, an extreme, uh, you know, basically a corruption-free society. I mean, you know, they have, have a little bit, but um, you know, there is there is a there is a sense of being part of a um, uh, you know a, a, a sort of shared ethical culture. It's also um, until recently been a very homogenous society. Um, it's, been, it's been said, for instance, that Sweden is one of the most um, uh, one of the most irreligious societies in terms of actual, you know, observant religion. But you can't understand Swedish culture without understanding Lutheranism. Um, you know, it was in the 1600s they actually went went to war and devastated Germany to, to protect the Protestants. They killed a lot of Protestants to protect them, but you know, this way uh, way as you as you rolls out. You know, point is that um, you know, uh, yes, if 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 we want to talk about about many of those um, uh, those equality case studies, you know, understand them for what they are. And as I say, you you find you find that 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 um, it, it it goes way beyond what uh, what government fiat is able to do. Um, there's a whole culture that go that that goes behind it, and there's also you know the freedom required to actually create those resources and create that happiness. As, uh, just Bear something in mind. Sweden didn't didn't lock down like like much of the rest of the world, and I remember there was this was appalling. You know how how could they buck the consensus? Someone actually said the Swedes are actually their secret of their success is that they're the ultimate pragmatists. And I don't know, you know who 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 came out of that better? Uh, Martin and Terence, um, uh, I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Perhaps uh, one question from my side. Um, and you can just a quick response. Uh, one of the buzzwords that you hear at universities um, today is social justice. Um, I'm just interested to hear again from your perspective. Um, I, I, I know that Tom, Thomas Sowell argument is social justice means no justice at all. But I'm just interested again from your perspective, um, you know, how do you see the concept, um, you know, what does it mean in terms in light of 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 your um your commitment to classical liberalism and just a, a brief comment on that um i would appreciate thank you martin martin goes first yeah sure so I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible it's not a, it's not an easy topic um but yeah so the the liberal kind of approach is that justice is a concept that relates to an individual only the individual thinks only the individual acts and only the individual can ultimately uh, conceive of and accept responsibility and accountability for decisions and actions that the individual has acted upon. And therefore, only the individual is entitled to just deserts and so on. So justice is very much an individualized concept. Now, I'm not totally ruling out the possibility of generalizing justice. Um, so I, I would say that there, the possibility of a liberal social justice is possible, uh, but it, it would be significantly more basic uh, than, than what is known as social justice today. And what is known as social justice today in the contemporary world is a it's 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 putting makeup on socialism if if i if i can put it that way um and and uh, we see that whenever there is an appeal to social justice if you just dig a little bit beneath the surface you will see that there hides a, a a desire for more government control of something whatever it may be uh, some kind of government imposition regimentation of uh, what people can freely decide and do for themselves. So people talk about social justice. It sounds nice. Oh, it's justice. So of course, you must accept and, and agree with it. But ultimately, you just have to dig dig a little bit. And then you'll find the very ugly face of, of Karl Marx uh, uh, hiding there. And then you have to kind of just slap him away. Um, but of course, let's let's 
try and and formulate a a more equitable and more kind of fair idea of social justice, uh, one that is con uh, compliant and consistent with freedom and uh, uh, the uh, the agency of the individual. I'm all for that, but that's not what what we have today. Look, I think that that this is an issue that where you actually need your your conceptual ducks in a row. What are you uh, uh, what are you talking about? To uh, you know, who is going to be opposed to social justice? You know, it's sort of, it's it's a bit like saying, you, you know, in, in in our national anthem we talk about let us live and strive for freedom. Well, who's a who's opposed to freedom? You know, Mao or Stalin would have would have said that they are bringing freedom to their societies, just like you asked them to define it. And it probably doesn't look like 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 what you're thinking adolf hitler you know would talk about that um so yeah first of all i think it's a bit of a nonsense term because all justice i think is inherently social and in that you need more than one uh, more than one party and you know so by definition um however look i mean i i i do agree with 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 martin up to um up, up to a point i would say that um i think what differentiates let's say the contemporary left from you know your 19th century socialist types or even your new left of the 1960s is that um they were actually commendably honest about what about, about what they were uh, 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 what they were after and there were certain like you know holy texts and you could i, I think that that provides a, a, um, a, a, a basis on which you could engage um you know, you do find that that uh, there are some some very trenchant criti uh, uh, criticisms of this on the left. Um, uh, you know, like, but, but they they tend to be your old your, your sort of old school types. Um, you know, I I mean, I although I'm certainly not a left winger or a socialist myself, I do you know I do think that there that there is something to be, is, there is something at least conceptually of value to be gained from those from those traditions. The problem, I think, with 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 the social justice discourse, and I think that it very much is a discourse. It's about um, phrasing things in a certain way that it 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 disarms any possible um, uh, uh, any possible argument. Um, I would encourage everybody to look at the work of Jonathan Haidt, and you, know, you don't you don't have to you don't have to have to read his stuff. Find you can find him on YouTube. Reasonable, well thought out. Uh, you know about why some of these impulses there, and they're actually not bad. You know, I don't, I don't want, I don't think, I think just as a matter of politeness, I don't want to cause offence to people. But you know, when you define someone as bad for holding an opinion that you disagree with, you've circ you've um, uh, uh, short circuited, uh, you've short circuited the argument. And that's why I'd like to thank everyone for being here. You know, and I'm hoping. I, I hope that some of you disagree with me. I hope you disagree with me profoundly. You know, we don't have to hate each other. We can actually, you know, even even be friends over that um, uh, 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 over that disagreement. And I hope that if you disagree with me profoundly, there may be something useful that you can that 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 you that that you can take away. But you know, but look, let me, you know, coming coming to the to 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 the pragmatism, and I, you know, this is how I try to phrase my talk. If someone talks about um, social justice, I think it's a good it's it's a reasonable assumption that they frame of reference is going to be, well, you know, staff isn't in this proportion or that proportion or whatever. And I think that that is that is an easy idea along the way out. However, let me let me say that um, if, if if I went into a university campus, now I don't have any any evidence to back this, but I'd like to encourage someone someone to do this. Um, go and ask students what what they find the most challenging issue in, 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 in doing their studies. And I'm pretty, and I would predict, and maybe I'm wrong, that you would find that um, the most marginalized, disadvantaged people going, uh, going to university, I think probably, the, pro probably the, the, the single biggest issue may well be language. How do, you, how do you deal with it? I don't know. But, you know, uh, uh, pointing out that it's someone else's fault or, you know, like you're not um uh accepting my lived experience or whatever i don't think that that's that's that that's particularly helpful and as i say i don't i don't know what the solution is but you know at least then we would we would have a, we would have we would identify the problem but it's also it's not one of those that that that, that fits into an easy block and not thank an ideological you, block 
Thank you, Terence and Martin, and, and thank you for availing yourself to to speak about these things. Um, I think, as my colleague mentioned there in the chat box a, as well, it, it's thought-provoking ideas from both of you, challenges the, the norm, which is something that just speaks to my heart. I'm not sure if it's the rebel <laughs> that you, Martin, referred to that still hasn't gone or whatever, but I think these debates are important from from all sides and and in, involving all um all actors and agents in in society so from the department side and from my side thank you for for your your expertise and, and your 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 views and and all these things and and for your time most importantly in availing yourself to to address um the the theme of, of today's webinar and um and to the audience as well thank you so much uh, thank you so much Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.